for Claire to join. All right, we'll see if anybody else joins, but um, today we're going to have um, Claire Price talking about the Slimers project and um, specifically about some spatial analysis that she's been doing on um, slug numbers and fields. I know we had a lot of slugs in my own garden this year, and uh, the idea for this is to identify things that can predict where a lot of slugs will be in order to do um, targeted application of anti-slug uh, stuff. And she's going to demonstrate, I think, we'll see what she she does when she gets here, but there's a technique that's very popular amongst ecologists called SADI, which is very easy to do, and it's very easy to do in R. And I think she's just going to talk through a use case for that. I, I think it's applicable to a lot of things in agriculture or precision agriculture in particular. So uh, maybe that'll be useful. The thing that I think that I will, will say something about, though, um, while we wait for Claire, is about next week's meeting. Um, some of you may be aware of the charity. Maybe I'll just bring up a, a um, PowerPoint to note my thoughts as I go through this. There's a, um, a prominent charity uh, that's, that's uh, active around the world called the um, Raspberry Pi Foundation. And um, what they're most well known for is the piece of hardware that's a little computer called the Raspberry Pi. And um, they invented this platform as a way to prototype. Uh, on one hand, it's a platform to prototype um, so-called edge computing, where it's a, it's a little computer. And I think their original tagline was um, to create a fully functional computer with an operating system and everything for less than 20 pounds or $20. And um, they did that some years ago. Um, I think my son has had a Raspberry Pi for some years. And uh, it's no more the, the good old days of um, a Raspberry Pi for $20. I think it's around, I don't know, 75 pounds or something for a, the newest Raspberry Pi. But they're still a neat platform. And um, th their big success uh, is in two ways. One is in the development of the platform and the popularity of these pieces of hardware. But they, they really are even more well-known these days for um, their charitable education. Um, and the education that they're interested in supporting has to do with um, computer science and um, uh, coding and uh, how the web works and things like that. And they they particularly target um, uh, young young people, students in schools, and uh, it's students from all ages, from uh, eight to uh, to eighty you know, as they say on their website. And um, one of the one of the ways that they do that is through this this arm of the Raspberry Pi Foundation called coding clubs. And coding clubs might be something that would be launched in communities for kids, um, you know, eight to uh, eight to 14 or 15 or something. And um, they would run after school, they would run in libraries. That, and, you know, there are a lot of them around the country. They actually have another version of, of the coding club called the Coder Dojo. And the, the ethos of the Coder Dojo is for, um, for students that are 15 plus uh, onwards, and they can run in schools like colleges or, you know, six forms or communities or anything. And it's really just for people that are interested. And uh, well, what we've done here, a lot of you are, are aware that Harper has this um, ambitious new, new location called uh, Station Quarter, Telford. 
Hi, Claire. I see you there. Just give me a moment and I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. And uh, they, they call their site. Um, this is kind of like the brand name. Uh, Harper at Telford. And the building that they're in is a uh, is a building like this, and it's called. And I've I only learned this myself a couple of months ago. It's called the Quad. And uh, the vision for the Quad, if you haven't already heard, is that uh, on the ground floor um, there's a community space that is a lobby and some meeting meeting rooms and things like that on the first floor is a college where they teach um, technical um, technical courses on the second floor is a university um, and that's that's us harper at telford and then on the third floor is an entrepreneurial space Um, I always love this word entrepreneur. Uh, this is for you, Claire. This is absolutely true that the uh, President George W. Bush made a uh, common, he had a legendary dislike of um, the French government during his reign as the American president. And one of the things of the many funny things he said was that the French don't even have a word for entrepreneur. Uh, and he also renamed French fries to freedom fries. Okay, but I digress. Um, in the second floor of the university, um, we're going to launch the data science, digital business, and um, and uh, robot robotics for manufacturing courses next year. Uh, then, actually, something that very few people in the university are aware of is that there there is a plan to launch um, a version of the existing data science course. The conversion course with three agriculture courses that would be located potentially in station quarter in February this year for a for a spring start and a second version of a data science master's course that is a um, that is not a conversion course that has eight core data science modules starting this spring it it's possible that that will happen I think there's some low probability, maybe 20 or 30% that it will happen. That's my estimation. But uh, in the effort to establish a brand and a presence in our building, uh, which we've just taken ownership of our floor just, just two weeks ago, um, we have decided to start a Coder Dojo. We already have a presence. Um, on the Raspberry Pi Foundation website, an official club. Now, the club, can, the name of these these coder dojos has a convention, which I've adhered to. Rather than calling it uh, Harper at Telford or Harper Uni Coder Dojo or anything like that, they uh, they actually have an at sign in the naming convention. And I've been asked many times why I didn't name it Harper at Telford. But the naming convention for the Coder Dojo is the name of the city. At uh, the location where the Coder Dojo is, and um, for us, I've I've called it Station Quarter. So Telford at Station Quarter is the name of our Coder Dojo. Well, the first meeting is uh, next week. Um, everyone here is invited. Uh, if you just want to come, you will probably want to make a little bit of um, just let me know if you're interested in coming. Um, here's what you need to do in order to come. So some of the people that are in the chat already, um, oh, we're going to miss you. Um, the, that'll mean there's at least one extra cupcake that someone will have to eat. Um, but I'll save you a... Oh, no. a I'll save you a Telford Codes uh, hex sticker. Um, what we're going to do is the the third Thursday of each month, 
we're going to meet at in person uh, at the um, the space in the new data science lab there. And uh, we're going to we're going to work on fun problems and projects to learn Python, to teach Python, to do automation, maybe working with Raspberry Pis, maybe working on web applications, data science stuff. Um, and uh, this first meeting next week is uh, is going to be to decide what we're going to start doing and and how we're going to start doing it. And um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation have a number of curricula. Um, I mean, I think a goal of this is to have some meetings facing, uh, if we go back to my little diagram here, some of the students on this floor, we would like to invite to come up and visit us and join the coding club on these Thursdays. And uh, the idea is obviously to, you know, maybe some of them would be interested in studying robotics or, or data science at the university. Um, we're we're interested in attracting students, maybe from non-traditional backgrounds, um, into computer science and uh, data science. If you're interested in coming along and seeing what it's about um, for next week, uh, now some people have already, and you know who you are, you already will have a card waiting for you to access the building. But if you want to just come next week, um, what you can do is you can email uh, Farmjet Chima. He's the former um, head of engineering, now the um, the emperor of Station Quarter. Uh, you can find his email easily. M most of you probably know Parmjin anyway. Email him and just tell him you want access to the building. You're going to attend the Coder Dojo. Now, um, if you want to um, park there, my understanding at the moment is that uh, in your email to Parmjit, you'll need to uh, tell him uh, your car registration make and color and uh, you'll be able to access the car park um, there's a little caveat with the car park that um, there are only 31 free spaces for Harper Adams and uh, the first 31 cars on a given day to come in the lot get a free space and number 32 will get a bill in the mail or something like that I don't really understand the situation 31, um, the number 31, some have said that it seems very small. And it, it also does to me, but the ethos of the station quarter is that um, it's a green, very connected space and you should be walking or riding your bike or taking the rail or um, uh, maybe an airplane, I'm not sure, but some other form of transport. Um, probably you won't be taking any Lime electric bicycles uh, they're apparently going to be banned here anytime uh it turns out that 31 car parking spaces was a point of negotiation it's the last thing i'll say and it, it it literally is 31 times the amount of car park spaces we are originally allocated we were originally allocated one so this is a big point of nego negotiation now some of us are going to carpool next week and we're going to leave campus at um 3 30 to get over there in time, to find the parking, to get our cards, and to be led up to the space, and maybe even to look around a little bit before we start the meeting. And if you want to join us, everyone is welcome. Um, if you need any help arranging, or you're confused about it, or have any questions, don't hesitate to drop it in the chat or email me. And on that note, I want to leave some time to learn all about slug spatial distributions from Claire. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Can you all hear me yet? Oh. Can you hear you fine? Uh, share my screen. Do, do, do. Right, can you all see that first slide? 
Yep, it's perfect. Cool. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm going to, well, I say introduce, but, but when I was doing my research uh, to prepare that slide, I, real, I discovered that this exact same uh, method has already been covered in a previous HAROG meeting back in 2022. But I don't think that, I think that most people present didn't attend it. But if you've seen the recording, I hope it's not going to be too repetitive. Um, and yeah, I'm going to try and apply it to my own research uh, with the slogs. Um, so I'll start by doing a bit of a background on my project, Slimers. I don't think all of you uh, know what it is about. So the Greenfield slog is uh, an important pest of arable crops in the UK. And um, growers used to control this pest by applying uh, pellets on the whole field. But because previous research has shown that um, the distribution of that slug is actually heterogeneous, so they are gathered in patches on the field instead of being evenly spread. So um, the aim is to try and develop a precision agriculture method to predict where these patches are. So then the growers can then only treat the patches of high slug density instead of uh, spraying the whole field. So that's the overall aim of the study. So to do that, we've uh, set up a grid of um, traps for slugs. So the traps are basically just a um, plant saucer turned upside down on the floor for the slugs to take refuge during the night. And then in the morning, the farmers would uh, check the traps and count the number of slugs. And these traps were set up on the grid you can see on the screen. So there's 100 of traps uh, on one hectare field and each of these traps are uh, labeled with a code so column a b c d until k and then uh, one two three in rows so um, these gave us different counts different numbers of slug um, over the field and uh, we used this data set to um, try to locate these patches and see if in this instance so we've uh, done that over 21 fields and we've had a look at different dates as well and trying to see if the patches are present uh, first and foremost and also if they are spatially stable uh, stable in time and uh, in space so now talking about uh, SAD so spatial analysis by distance indices so it's a method that has been introduced and developed by Joe Perry which who was a researcher at Rothamsted um, to enable ecologists to treat count-based data in relation to the location in a two-dimensional space where the locations are specified. So that applies to, uh, to my data because it's account-based and we have a location with the traps, uh, traps labels. And uh, the idea was to deal with data that was considered patchy, which is the case of a lot of insect population and also in my case, uh, of slug population. So this is uh, an ideal method. So one of the most uh, used uh, index in this method is uh, the index of aggregation, which quantifies the presence and degree of clustering. So it basically tells us based on the value whether the distribution is random, um, dispersed or aggregated. So if it's equal, one, it's randomly uh, arranged. If it's uh, below one, it will be uh, regularly, so dispersed. And if it is above one, it is considered clustered. So that's what we are interested in mostly. And it is also associated with a probability level PA, uh, which when it's not significant, it means that the result then uh, is not uh, significant basically so this is one of the output that you can have in R when you run the analysis so I'm showing you uh, on the slides and then we'll have a look uh, at the code in R so you've got here a value of IA that is over one so it uh, indicates a clustered distribution and because the probability is uh, below 0.05 then it is significant so that's good news that's what we want to see but then we have the, the I and VG indices, which respectively quantify the presence of patches or gaps within your uh, field. 
So this is part of the red blue analysis tool, which I will mention in the next slide. I should have these are not supposed to be here, the red arrows, but that's my fault. Um, so these provide a means to measure the presence of spatial patterns by ident identifying neighborhoods of consistently high counts, so patches or clustering, or low counts, gaps or dispersion. And this is what it looks like in R. So in R, they are identified as inflow and outflow. And they are associated as well with another index, which is the Paris index. So again, we'll see that uh, in R studio in a minute. And then the red blue part, this is an example of what it looks like. So we use these uh, VI and VG and indices to make that plot. And the cluster is defined as error enclosed by control levels of plus 1.5 or minus 1.5, which is based on the Paris index. So if the circle is red, it means that there's a cluster. And if the circle is blue, it means that there's a gap. And um, the size of the circle is also uh, indicating how strong uh, the clustering or the gaps are. So the bigger, the uh, stronger they are. And another plot that we can draw is is the interpolation plot. So it basically uh, makes a map that is a bit fuller and interpolate the values to the whole plot instead of just areas uh, where the traps are. So it's based on the values of the index. So if it's green the, and the values are negative, it means that there's a gap. If it's yellow, it's neutral. So there's neither gaps nor uh, cluster. And if it's pink, then it means that the values are positive, so they are uh, aggregation or clustering. So this is these are maps that we can obtain with uh, CID. But uh, I've got here a comparison between the CID map and um, a heat map that I've done with the field contour uh, function. And on this occasion, the uh, number of slugs was uh, uh, locked in, uh, because otherwise uh, the heat map was not very interesting to see. It was mostly dark. So that makes it easier to see. But yeah, we can try and compare and see if it's similar, uh, which is not always the case. But uh, I think it's quite an interesting uh, an interesting thing to see. Um, hey, can we I... linger on this for a second? Because th this is really yep. interesting to me. Yep. Can you w walk us through this um, and maybe um, show us the places you think match up pretty well and the, the things that don't? Uh, can you see my cursor or not at all? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, so I think like this here looks good, and here we can see there's a bit of a yeah. match. Not so much over here, but I don't know if it's because on that occasion I've had the number of slugs locked in and not here, or if it doesn't have an impact. I tried to do these uh, CD maps with the locked in, but my our studio had a brain freeze, so I thought I think they didn't <laughs> like it. Um, I had it crashed, and I had to restart the session. So I think I can't do that. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I'm just trying to. I can sort of see the right, the the one on the left there in the middle mm -hmm. that you pointed at, and I, I can also see. I can sort of think I can see the. The big number in the lower right but it's funny that sadie's interpretation shows this as a negative one but the actual yeah. number interpretation show it as a positive hotspot because mm -hmm. it's a big number it's the same yeah. thing with uh one that uh, another one that matches is the one that's about two-thirds up on the right hand side so there's a yellow hotspot yeah just right on that axis exactly and then you've got the positive so yeah. It, yeah, it is funny how it matches up in some ways and it misses it a little in others yeah i'm not 100 percent sure how but like um, probably we need to do it a bit more and on several different uh heat maps because i mean could do it but yeah there's potential to explore this a bit more but there yeah. are yeah there are big bits that match and bits that don't okay thanks for that and then I thought we could uh, have a look at the code. So if I stop sharing for a second, do I leave? 
this is and share my R Studio. Can you all see my R Studio yet? Yep, we can see it fine. Maybe oh. um, increase the magnification just slightly, please, for old eyes. Uh, yeah, how do we do that? Control plus a couple of times. Uh, if does... you have a Mac, it might be Apple key plus. I'm not sure. It's not working. Uh, control plus. Is it because I'm sharing now? I don't know. Uh, view, can I zoom in? Zoom in. Control equal. Control equal. All right, that's weird. Oh, yeah, looks good. Oh, it might be French keyboard thing or something. It's not French keyboard. I'm, at, I'm in the office. It's, uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. okay. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, is that better? Yep, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to load my library. So it's part of a much bigger script to load the data sets, but uh, I'm going to make it relatively simple um, just for the sake of focusing on Sadie. So this is the name, the code name of the field that we're interested in. And I'm going to load the data. Taking some time. There you go. And then getting rid of what I'm not interested in. So what we have here in the global environment are the data sets uh, separated into dates. So the same slow counts have been done five times. And there was 100 traps. And what we are interested in in here are the column num and row number, which uh, are the grid reference. And then the grid field slugs, which is the number of slugs that were found um, under the traps. So that's what we're going to be using for Sadie. And that's the same for all. So I've, in the example I'm going to show, I've just been using uh, slug one, so the first date. So something that we can do first is uh, there's some simple map that we can draw by using the count function and the mapping function. So with X as the row number, Y as the column number, and um, the date and the number of fill slugs. And we can see, it's not very pretty. So this shows the number of slugs on each traps. So it doesn't have any indices or anything, but it's nice visualization of what it looks like. And we can also visualize it like that, uh, but it's basically the same. And then to do the SADI, so we use the SADI function. And we uh, first need to transform the uh, data into a count, otherwise it doesn't work. And again, it's with the uh, row number, column number, and the number of Griffiths logs. Uh, the other arguments we have is threads. Uh, so by default, it is one. And if you want to analyze a very big data sets, it's better to increase that number to give a bit more computational power to your machine. And uh, so it doesn't run for uh, 10 minutes before you get the result. And perm is the number of permutations. So the uh, default is 100. And verbose uh, is true, so that's when, when you run the analysis, uh, you actually have in your console a uh, kind of like a progress bar to show how uh, your analysis is running. So if you see that it's very slow, you might need to increase the number of threads to actually make it run a bit faster. So if we run it, there you go, it's going. That's done. And then we have a look at the summary. So... These are the, this is the Perry index, and this is an, the uh, Lee Madden Cuse index, which is not computed because I have a lot of zeros in my um, data sets. So in that case, it's not uh, being applicable to the data sets. So as we saw in the um, slides, the inflow and outflow, so it's the I and VG, so clusters and gaps, and the main outputs that we are also interested in is the index of aggregation. So here it is over one. So in the case that it's aggregated, and because the probability is under uh, 0.05, then it means that it's significant. Uh, and then the red blue plot is basically just doing plot of your SADI object. 
so it appears here. And then if you want to have um, the interpolation uh, plots, you just have to add the ISO clients equal true argument and it appears here. And this is not, this is the repeat of the other one, so I don't need that. I don't know why I have that. So that's what I have on Sadie. If you have any question, happy to take them. Claire, thanks. That's very interesting. Um, I wonder if I, I'm interested in the um, data object that you produce with the count function. Yeah. Could, what what happens if you print that out? Um, if you like select the count function. Let's see, you need uh, mm -hmm. one, two. You need two of them. Yeah. What what happens if you print that out? Oh. That's interesting. There's so uh so you're you're passing it the whole data set. Yep. Yeah, it's just included all the columns. Okay, that's interesting. I'm uh I hadn't noticed that behavior myself of um diverging from uh just straight up matrix extrapolation and and Sadie. Mm -hmm. Have you is is it just that you noticed that or did you? I know you've read some things about Sadie. Have you ever seen yeah. a of that? Yeah, I I didn't. Yeah, I didn't get, you know, get the count uh, by myself. The count the code code can't talk by myself. Uh, so there's a few. If I go back to my slides, I have. A slide with what I've been using. So can you see that slide? Yeah. Yeah. So these are the papers. So that's the window paper that Ed uh, you recommend, recommended I read, and um, it's it's yeah. I think it's r really good in terms of explaining how to use Sadie and what it does exactly. I really like it, and I think everyone should read it if they're interested. Um, that's the original article by Joe Perry. I thought it was a bit more messy and not as intuitive as the Winder article. So I really prefer this one. The only uh, disadvantage, I'd say, of this article, the first one, is that it doesn't really explain how to do this on R. So for that, I had to look online. And these two are pages that had examples of codes on how to do your analysis. And they showed graphs and stuff. Um, so I'm happy to drop these in uh, the chat if you guys wanted to have a look. Um, but this is where I got the code um, from. Yeah, I think we, I think when um, when um, Peter Nagimbo and I were messing with it, that we made a lot of use of that vignette, the epiphy vignette. Mm. <clears throat> Can we go back up to your slide? Uh, Slide eight. Yep. <clears throat> I'm just trying to, um, I'm kind of thinking about your data set <clears throat> and um, the, I hadn't thought of this until you raised this idea that, that there might be some divergence between the actual counts and the, the matrix version of this. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that's in my head, I'll just spit it out and then pass it over to Joe, who has a question, is um, I'm thinking on the one hand, we're, we're the reason, the motivation for us using Sadie was to use a simple test that matched the data for objectively evaluating the presence of clumping. So we get that p-value with the index of aggregation, mm -hmm. but, but that we have to be careful visualizing it like this, or maybe even showing it to um, naive stakeholders like this, because this is fundamentally different to where the slugs are. And one of the things the stakeholders really want is they want to know where the slugs are so they can know where to put the um, poison. Yeah, I suppose that it's one of the main difference with the heat maps. Maybe the heat maps are more focused where the slugs are exactly. And yeah, the other map is not as precise for that. 
So yeah, I suppose depending on who you talk to, you might want to show one map or the other. The other thing I was thinking, and this I'll just shut up after this, but it's something I think we should play around with is um, we've discussed in the past um, ways of manipulating the scale of these heat maps to show something sensible, you know, that we want to show. Yep. And I think it might be worth, like on some of the, you haven't shown all of your maps, but an, in an email outside of this talk, you recently sent us a bunch of heat maps and I was just looking through them. And um, I, even though I have a expert eye, you might say, about looking for patterns in spatial maps, uh, some of them I was like, yeah, if I, if I didn't have the P value there, I would have a hard time, mm -hmm. you know, deciding. And so I started thinking maybe, maybe there would be a way to manipulate the scale that's displayed on the um, the heat map part. And and a thing I was thinking of, uh, if you define a slug, like one of the things we've discussed in the project is that people think that, uh, well, if you need a, a threshold of how many slugs there are before you start using slug aside, mm -hmm. um, maybe four is a number let's start with. And it's a it's somewhat arbitrary number, but let's just start somewhere. So, so what if you turned all of the numbers below four to the coldest possible color and wherever that threshold on the spectrum is to above five and, and just show the peaks of the heat map, what that would make is it would make those cold areas bigger between the peaks. I just would like to see what that looks like for statistically significant clumps or not. Mm. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. I agree. Joe? Thanks, Ed. Hi, thank you. Kind of corner. Okay. I, I would have sought to cut. Um, your voice is going in and out. You're having that microphone thing. <laughs> maybe oh, put your put your happening again. Yeah, maybe speak a little bit louder. I guess I think it's voice noise activated. Yeah, it's partly me. Otherwise, you're going to have to use modern dance. There'll be no other solution. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think uh, what I wanted to say, you partly said, I wanted to sort of relate uh, Sadie to what an end user would be interested in, which are the slug numbers, which, which come with the interpolation, with the heat map itself. Um, I think you made that comment, but maybe my remaining question would be, um, how stable is uh, SADI? Is that an interesting study to conduct, for example, to change the number of permutations and capture the index value that it produces and then see how, how that depends on the number of permutations so that you can generate some uncertainty? To uh, I've did try to change the number of permutation to see what it does. So obviously, the more you do, the slower it is. Um, but what I've seen that the uh, index of aggregation and its associated p-value do vary, but it still remained significant. Um, so I think it would be worth doing it with other uh, sets to see if it's actually consistently the same, about the same, or if it's actually sometimes it can actually change whether it's significant or not. But when I tried on this one, um, regardless of the number of permutations, it was still relatively the same value. So I think that's the case. But I think, yeah, well, we need to do it a bit more. And is, is the number of permutations pretty much the only argument or parameter that you optimize for, uh, or hyperparameter, if I may call it, that you choose as a person? Are there uh, that are fixed there that are worth? Yeah, because I could have changed the number of threads, but it's a fairly small data set and it runs fairly fast, so I didn't bother changing this one. Um, so I think in terms of argument, there's not much else that I can change. I feel like it, it seems to be quite a fairly simple function with not many arguments, um, but I might be wrong. Yeah, very, very interesting. I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, 
interesting inquisitive next that you can apply to this. For example, uh, changing the the intensity of observation. So deleting some columns randomly and rows and seeing if it's if it produces the same map, if the data points are fewer to optimize how many reads, quadrats you need to take. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think yeah, interesting. Thank you. Have you um <clears throat> have you run the the Sadie stats? Um are, are there Sadie stats in Emily's study where she looked at the slug in regular years or I don't think there is, it's just Mantel tests, I think. Yeah, she hasn't looked. From what I've seen, she hasn't looked at this uh, at all. She's done heat maps like this one uh, on the yeah. left, but yeah. no, I don't think she's done Sadie. And and if you compare the statistical significance, doing the the um, spatial stats with Sadie, uh, do you get qualitatively similar results? Um, have, you tried, have you tried looking at it? What do you mean? We had some sort of um, stats test involving uh, a matrix test for aggregation um, Moran's index. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wondered if we had compared it to see if um, the pattern of significance was similar, or if it diverged in any kind of uh, concerning ways. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The first time, like I, when I started analyzing the data set, I first was using the Morans test, and then I also did the uh, index of aggregation. Some of them were similar, most of them, but there was some in, uh, instance where the distribution was going from clumped to random or random to clumped. Um, so there are some differences. Um, but from what I've seen, they're not technically looking at exactly the same thing. So that might yeah. be why there are some differences, because they're not actually completely uh, interchangeable they are a little different yeah, yeah. I, just, I just i guess I, I was thinking of it in a purely applied statistics way is um maybe there was some systematic difference in the statistical power mm. of one test over another one was more sensitive than another something like that mm -hmm. the, there's a like a point that I would say that, um, so we have a few minutes here, unless somebody else has another question, is that um, this method is based, it, it was, it came about in the 90s. Um, this was way before I learned about it. But uh, I did become aware of the the tradition of statistics that Sadie's based on at some point during my PhD in the early 2000s. and. Um, this was called um, resampling statistics. <clears throat> and uh, this was a time in, in history, it's almost hard to imagine such a time these days where um, computers were rare sitting on, um, and they had been rare, let's say in the previous decade, they were, they were, it was becoming common for them for every desk to have a desktop computer or a laptop. But, um, these statistics called resampling statistics were computational based on, and they're non-parametric. And so they were very appealing for a lot of ways, solving a lot of problems. And for the first time, ecologists and other interesting people uh, could make use of computers and could start programming them. And a lot of people went crazy. People, statisticians were really interested in and still are interested in resampling statistics. And uh, some of the thinking and tools that gave rise to Sadie also gave rise to the modern practice of uh, computational Bayesian statistics. Oh, it's, uh, historically, this is a very specific implementation of a, of a broad way of thinking that um, hasn't become mainstream. It never did become mainstream. And now Bayesian statistics, computational Bayesian statistics have, have replaced rather old-fashioned uh, resampling statistics by modern standards. But um, I, I was interested in that. I just thought I'd say it about Sadie. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Well, thank you very much, Claire. Can um, give applause with the hands on the top. I'm going to uh, stop the recording there.
Um, I want to take this moment to um, 